Last week, Andrew did paper, rock, scissors, and it sort of got me thinking this morning. I want to do something just with the rock part, all right? So everyone do the rock, both hands. What we're doing is we're making a fist this morning, all right? And now in a moment, I want you to make that fist and hold it as tight as you can. I realize some of us, I've got one finger which is a bit sore, damaged, and it hurts, but now I realize some people are going to feel that, but just make that fist right as tight as you can, okay? And keep clenching it as hard as you can, and while you're doing that, smile. Okay, really nice smile while you're clenching your fist. Come on. Yeah, they don't look like good smiles, I must say. Why is that? It's really hard to smile while you're clenching your fist. It's much easier to grit your teeth, isn't it? You grit your teeth and do that, it's much easier. Okay, now relax your hands and just open them up. Just open them up. Just nice, open sort of stance. I feel like a therapist here this morning. Um, just open your hands. And now smile. You already are. It kind of goes together. It's kind of really natural, isn't it? You know, closed fists, hard to smile, open hands. It just comes much more naturally. Um, we're in our second last week of this Faith at Work series, and today I'm talking about giving generously. And I really think this is a good metaphor for what we're talking about today. Whether we're tight-fisted in life with our lives and our resources or whether we're open-handed, which is really a good metaphor for generosity. And, uh, and we know, don't we, in our experience of life, whenever you are open-handed and you give to bless somebody, maybe in need, or you give in a way that God's called you, and I, there's a whole pile of generous people sitting here, you know that that brings the greatest joy in life, don't you? I mean, that really is the greatest joy when you're giving um, in some way. And we also know that one of the biggest causes of stress in our lives is when we're holding on tight and we don't want to let go is one of the bigger causes of stress and unhappiness. Well, James, in his letter, as we've been looking at it, he has this big idea we've been looking at through this series, that faith that is genuine is a faith that works. It's, it's active in doing good, and sort of generosity, as we look at today, certainly fits in with that. And we've looked at how that works out. You know, we've looked at faith in action. It perseveres under pressure. It listens to God and obeys what he calls us to do. It loves extravagantly without favoritism. It uses words to build up and bless. It resists conformity through humility and today gives generously. And, and, and James makes this point early in his letter that faith without deeds is dead. He's pretty straight as we've learned James through this book. Um, and let me just read a few verses uh, from chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So James is asking this question a couple of times in these, in these verses. You know, what good is it? Did you see that? What good is it? So if someone's in need and you simply wish them well but don't offer any help and they come to you, what good is faith? And the answer, it's no good, is it? It's no good. It's not doing any good. <laughs> You know, maybe there's some comparative examples we could think of. You know, if you've got a, a lawnmower and everybody's using that more than ever at the moment, um, but it has no blades, it's no good, is it? Like it might sound like a lawnmower, you can push it around like a lawnmower, but it's not going to cut the grass. It's no good. If you've got a car without an engine, it's cheap to run, far out. Petrol prices, it's really cheap to run but it's not going to take you anywhere. It's no good, is it? You know, it looks like a car, but it doesn't drive. And I think this is what James is saying. He's saying if you claim to have faith in Jesus, you might, it might sound like faith with your words, it might look like faith on the outside, but if it makes no difference to anyone or is kind of parked and not moving forward, what good is it? What's the answer? Everyone shout it out. It's no good. It's no good. 
So James asks, um, he says, can such a faith like that save someone? And this question has confused a lot of people. Even Martin Luther, the great reformer, called James the gospel of straw at one point because he was struggling with this book that was so much about works when the gospel is all about grace. Do works save? No, they don't, do they? I mean, faith alone in Jesus' work on the cross, his atoning sacrifice for our sins alone saves. We can't do anything towards that. We add our works towards that. We pull away from the power of the cross. It's completely God's work. So James isn't saying that, hey, our works suddenly save us, but he is saying that a person that has saving faith in Jesus will demonstrate that faith by their deeds. Works don't save, but they are the evidence of salvation in a person's life. So verse 26 says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So in this example, um, James is saying, someone comes to you in need and, and you wish them well with a smile while you're clenching your fists instead of opening your hands. That's not faith. Your forced smile is masking a heart that isn't moved. It's not engaged. It's not, it's not beating with the life of God. And so we learned in, in this letter that James wants so much more for his brothers and sisters. That's what he's just saying all the time. He's putting himself in that. He's not preaching at them. He's not teaching at them. He's saying, brothers and sisters, this is what we struggle with. And, and let's look at this stuff together, which we struggle with. And And he wants them to know the abundant life that beats within the faith that saved them. The joy and the freedom of being open-handed instead of the joyless stress of this tight-fisted, stingy living. In James 5, he, he, he writes perhaps some of the hardest words in the letter and possibly the New Testament I said to Andrew last week, I said, great job, that was a tough passage. And Andrew said, I think the next one's harder. Who's preaching? And I said, I am. But there is a difference um, um, between what James has said probably throughout his letter when he's saying a lot of challenging words. We've seen so many of them. He's always saying, dear brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, but he doesn't say that in these verses that we're about to read. And commentators agree that what he's wanting to show followers of Jesus is that where tight-fisted life can actually lead you without faith, it can actually cost a person everything. So it's James 5, 1 to 6, he says, and it's called warning to rich oppressors in my Bible. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. Whoa. They are full-on words as you read those. Um, It's a sobering picture of where the love of money can take a person. And he, and he talks about kind of these three things that happen in this person's life, in this rich oppressor's life. It's, the first one is hoarding. You know, they're people who they just can't bear to let go of anything. You know, they store up all these things for the future. Or maybe like a trophy cabinet to impress others, but it's all just rotting, tarnishing. It's not doing any good for anybody and not even themselves. Um, he, he gives this picture of this person is, is extravagant. Um, luxury and self, self-indulgence is their lifestyle. You know, their goal is to live the most lavish lifestyle possible, to have the best of everything they possibly can. And then the third thing 
we see here is this injustice that kind of flows out of this. Um, withholding resources from those who have even earned them from them. They're, they're so consumed with what they want that they can't see those who are desperately in need. And tragically, this also, James sort of says, leads to the loss of life of innocent, an innocent person here in this situation. You know, perhaps somebody is silenced for speaking out or, or maybe it's more indirectly. Someone died through the conditions they live and work in purely to serve the rich who don't care for them. You know, these words are, are not condemning people who have wealth or that you can't own anything nice or make a wise investment with your finances or enjoy life's pleasures that God has given us. It, it, it's not saying that. It's not saying that. The problem isn't having money. The problem is loving money. That's what it's saying. And that's what makes wealth incredibly dangerous. So the rich oppressor is living totally for themselves. They use their wealth purely to create the most comfortable life they can without a thought for those who have little. So this is the closed-fisted life in its uh, darkest moment, which is judged harshly by God throughout the Bible. You know, somebody might be the envy of the world in, in our Western society to have amassed great possessions and, and live this lavish luxury. You know, they make TV shows about that, don't they? But James gives another perspective, and you won't see this on the TV, and he compares them to an animal fattened for slaughter. I read about a, a turkey farm, I heard about where turkeys roam free in this beautiful countryside. As much food as they want, these are prized turkeys. And on October of the year, the fields are full of plump turkeys. But in December, the fields are empty. Why? It's Christmas time. They were being fed up for Christmas, slaughter. James is saying, you know, lovers of money can make the same mistake as they hold tightly onto this short life with no concern for the next. See, in the end, everyone stands before Jesus the same, don't we? Every single person the same. I tuned in to Ken Isles' funeral, in, um, which is Thea's dad on Friday. I saw the live stream of Ken. Um, you know, simple guy, Salvation Army Church, you know, humbly to serve God all his life. And the pastor sort of mentioned that on the same day there was uh, Bert Newton's funeral as well, on Friday as well. And, uh, and he was just, wasn't judging Bert, he was just making, there's just a big difference between the funerals, you know. Bert got a state funeral. Everyone knows about him, but probably hardly anyone knows about Ken. God just lived humbly, loved his family, loved Jesus. And, and both of those guys are going to stand before Jesus as equals. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference um, whether you're known or not. You stand before Jesus as equals at the end of our lives. You know, the United States president and a person living in a slum that you've never even heard of on a dollar a day are going to stand before Jesus as equals, exactly the same. And in the end, it comes down not to what we have or how significant we were in the world's eyes, but to our faith in Jesus. Of whether we trusted in his work on the cross by placing our lives in his hands. And the one with faith in him is unlikely to spend a life with ever-tightening fists, but more likely ever-opening hands, regardless of our economic position. I remember being in the Solomon Islands on a mission trip and coming to the service, and people had nothing materially. And people brought fruit and vegetables in for their offering. <laughs> it's incredibly powerful to see generosity 
among the poorest people. And so James isn't actually talking or differentiating between a wealthy or a poor person here, but about the attitude of a heart towards our resources. And James wants his readers to see how awful loving money can be. He's trying to paint that picture, how awful it can be. It will cost a person everything and do no good in this world when loving Jesus will give you everything and do so much good in this world. I mean, Paul says it like this to his mentee, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 12. He says, uh, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this, Timothy, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So here's Paul, young guy, Timothy, you're going, to be, you're going to be so seduced by this world. Fight against it. Flee from that. Pursue this. So how do we flee from this danger of money that's so seductive in our society and pursue this life of faith and love and, and generosity? Well, the answer is found in how much we actually make our plans in this life, of how we make our plans, I should say. So James actually precedes this warning to rich oppressors with these words to the church. And it's really important to know where that passage fits in the context of James's letter. So these are the words that just come immediately before it in chapter 4, verse 13 to 17. And Andrew uh, used this as well last week as part of his message. Verse 13, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So James centers these verses around a person who's making a plan to go to a city for a year, to grab some sort of business opportunity with the goal of making a pile of money. And that's kind of the case study he's working with here. And the point James is making isn't that it's wrong to go to a city and make money, that could be a great opportunity, um, and all the rest of it. But the fact that the person is making this plan without involving God as if they are in control of their life and their destiny. They are boasting about how successful they will be. Look at this niche in the market I found. Look at this incredible investment I've created. Look at where this is going to end up. See, whether we are tight-fisted or open-handed, it actually comes down to how we make our plans in life. See, many plans we make in life are just are connected to our finances, aren't they? I mean, we take a job sometimes influenced by what that pay rate is or, or the house that we live in or the lifestyle we're seeking to live or the future we're preparing for. It's all in there. And maybe we learnt our life's plan from our parents or our grandparents or our culture or whatever and there can be often some really good wisdom that's passed on to us about managing finances, about investing, and all these sort of things. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but the issue James is raising for it is is how does our faith work around that planning? Do we sort of just enter into this, this is what you do in life without even considering God in that? And just try to fit it around that somehow? Or is God involved at the forefront of our finance decisions in life. I mean, we could make plans that our culture would say, that's great, but they leave absolutely no margin for generosity and lock up our finances to the day we die. So what's influencing our planning the most? I want to introduce you to someone this morning. He 
lives in my shed usually, but I pull him out every now and then. So hello to I, everyone. We all know this guy really, really well, don't we? He's got a lot of influence in my life. He's probably got a lot of influence in your life as well. And we live in a culture that is increasingly geared towards putting this guy in the forefront of everyone's life and in the highest place, isn't it? I mean, you think about the algorithm that works in the background of social media and web searching and uh, you know, YouTube or whatever else. is this algorithm that's learning your preferences and then it's going to put up posts, it's going to put up ads that, that, that you like, that you prefer. And it gives you this illusion that you're in control and you're important and life is just all geared towards you. I mean, you we think about the way we watch TV now. We, we stream TV, don't we? We used to get the TV week. Uh, you're going to be over 50 to remember that. And check out, oh, I might watch those shows this week. We don't need that anymore. We watch what we want, when we want. And it's even suggests, based on what we've watched, what we should watch, and might be the best thing for us to watch, isn't it? The algorithm. We all know about it. We know, maybe you think, oh, that's why it happens. And we think, you know, it's putting us in control. And that algorithm is working to make people a lot of money. You realise that? The longer you stay on something, the more likes they get, the more time they get, the more money they can charge the people who want to advertise through them. So did you realize your time is currency today? We are a product, but we're told that we're in the center of everything. I'll put him down for a moment. Well, James is, you know, we're immersed in a world like that more than ever before that you are the most important person on the planet. You are in control of your life. And James is saying, before algorithms even existed, don't fall for this charade, this lie. So he tries to wake up the church with a reality check before we get too sucked in by the culture around us. And James, once again, does not miss his points. And he makes two. He says, the first one, he says, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, he says. You're planning, but you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, maybe in 2019, we might have rolled our eyes at that and felt fairly secure. You know, I'm a, I'm a left brain process, linear thinker. I can just, like, you know, I can plan out all the steps. I can have plan A, B, C, and D. If something goes wrong, you know, we, we're confident we can deal with it. But here we are now in 2021, and we're thinking, yeah, actually, I know what James means. We've just lived 20 months of not knowing what will happen tomorrow. You know, the world changed. Life changes without warning. So we're used to not knowing what will happen tomorrow. And James needs us to live in that reality that we can't control the future. We need to acknowledge that. And the second thing is, James says, is your life is like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And it sounds a bit like James is putting us down. But he's not. He, he's telling us the truth in light of eternity. You know, I was born in 1967, and you don't have to add that up. I'm 54. And uh, I looked up the average Australian in 1967 lived to 70 years of age. That was the lifespan. Now it's 2021, and the average lifespan of an Australian is 82. So it's increased 12 years over 54 years. And, and that's amazing, isn't it? That's advanced in medicine, all the rest of it in, in the Western world that's uh, created that. And it seems like a long time, but when you think about 70 years or 80 years or 60 years or 90 years, it's actually a vapor compared to everlasting life, isn't it? It's really brief. It, it appears and then it goes. And yet we make plans in this life as if this life is really long and mostly what it's all about and we need to prove that we are really important. 
I, I want to ask, uh, hands up if you can name your great-grandparents. The first names, right, straight off your head, you can name the name, first names of your great-grandparents right now. So there's about three people. I mean, they lived on this world not that long ago. Blood coursing through their veins. And it kind of shows you that it's not that they're not unimportant, they're not valuable people or all the rest of it, but even their own families move on pretty quick and, and don't remember. See, the world moves on very fast beyond our lives, doesn't it? If we're living just for this world. So our plans need to consider that we're these mist-like lives that we have. We can easily use up on pursuits that rob our time and resources that don't do that much good. So James is saying to remember in our planning that the future is uncertain, our lives are short. And that's pretty challenging. Well, it's been very challenging so far, this message, hasn't it? So what's the good news that we can get to in all of this? What's the great gospel truths? Well, what James teaches here is actually about setting us free. See, the tight-fisted life of holding on to control, thinking I can secure the future, I can hold on to my life as long as I can, is actually a terribly stressful and joyless way to live. It's behind so much of the anxiety and fear that grips so many about their life and their future. And we can think, because my plans aren't working out, then it's up to me to turn that all around. And if I can't, I'm just a hopeless failure. And if it has worked out and I'm really successful, I've got to hold on to that. It'll be the worst thing in the world if I ever lost that. But our Heavenly Father, through James, wants us to loosen our grip on planning and control and to open our hearts to God's plan and take a breath without a mask, you know. <laughs> the one who made you, who gave you breath, who loves you, who knows the future of your life, who has the very best path for you. And God's plans will lead us to a an open-handed life where we experience this joy and this freedom of an active and alive faith of a generous life that honors God, that brings blessing to others and stores up treasures in heaven that will never be robbed or fail or rot. You know, when we think about God, what is kind of one of the defining characteristics of God that we love so much? He's generous, isn't he? Our God is generous generous i mean it's seen in him giving his only son for us so that we could have life i mean this is the focus of christmas it's all about the generous gift of god and we love as a church to tell this story and point people to this god who is so incredibly generous and wants to be generous with them and we are people made in god's image image so it is natural for us to actually reflect his generosity in our lives I mean, it takes, as we learned right at the beginning, it more effort, doesn't it, to, to keep your hands closed. And that's because God's an open-handed God and it's much more natural to live that way. And one of the reasons we can be reluctant to give away, and I think, I think for Christians, I don't think it's actually greed. I think it's, it's fear. It's fear of provision. Am I going to have enough if I'm generous? Um, that was the case for those Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6, Jesus said that you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money in this world. You know, it, it just doesn't work. You've got to pick, pick your God here. Uh, but then he encouraged those listening that when Jesus is your master, you don't have to worry all the time about provision. You don't have to worry all the time about tomorrow. First, because worry is not going to actually change anything. But second, because I know about your needs and I love you and I care about you. And he says in, in, in um, chapter 6, verse 33, that if we seek first God's kingdom, we really can trust him to take care of us. You know, loving God first is the calling on the follower of Jesus. It's the evidence of genuine faith, but it's also the very best way to live. 
You know, it's not without cost or sacrifice, but it's a life that is an open channel for God to bless the world through. And Jesus is the best, isn't he? I mean, he really is the best. And his way, of course, is the best. So when he says these things, we know he's speaking good things for us. So we seek his plans first before making our own. We offer him the first of our lives, our time, our resources. That's the Jesus way, the the open-handed life. So how does this work in practice? Well, what are some practices that keep our hands open and show that, you know, God really is involved in my life and in my finances? Just two examples to finish with. The first one is um, tithing, isn't it? Parents often teach their kids from a young age to tithe, to give their very first of what they earn to God from their pocket money. Why? Because the church needs their 20 cents (laughs) from Sunday school? Or a teenager because the church needs their two bucks from the $20 they earn mowing a lawn? No, it all helps. But because they want to teach their kids, they want their kids to give their hearts to Jesus. And they know that the one thing that will compete for their kids' hearts more than anything in this world is money. So setting a pattern early before income increases in your life will more likely result in an open-handed life before the world's going to tell you to close it and close it tight. And for all of us, if you're a follower of Jesus here today, you know that tithing is actually such a blessing to our lives to be in that pattern, to know the freedom of involving God in our finances, to understand that we're stewards of what belongs to God in the first place and to acknowledge him in that, to prioritize a percentage that we give away first from our income before anything else and trust God to provide with what's left. And on top of that is the knowledge that we are playing our part to support the ministry and mission of Jesus through his local church and wherever else we give that we belong to. You know, what incredible joy it is when we see in this place young people responding to Jesus. How good is it to see Henry and Riley up here this morning to hear of teams of young people going to serve down on the Gold Coast. When we see kids running around in this place, we are so full of joy. When we see new people find a place to belong, maybe that's you here today, that you've actually found a family to belong to, a place where you can mesh your lives with others. When we share this Christmas story this year, together as a church, this message of hope and life, when we give away out of our outreach budget to those who have so little in the world, You know, we're all sharing in the mission of the church as we give. And it's an incredible blessing to know that we're part of something. Our open hands are so often lifted in praise to God for the absolute privilege of being part of bringing hope to the world. Do you agree with this, church? Is this right? It's a joy. And the second example to finish is a practical thing to do is actually Plan to be generous in your life. I mean, James said that rather than make plans to make money like we're in control, we should seek God's will about whether we do this or that. You know, there's not just one sort of way that people give or God leads us each individually at different times. You know, it's very freeing to know that we don't have to write the script in life or make it up as we go along. We listen to God's plan and in doing that, We're planning to be generous where he leads. Jesus gave us a verse as a church, which is from the start of the Sermon on the Mount, to let our light shine like a city on a hill in this place so that people see our good deeds, our faith at work, and they will praise our Father in heaven. What are these good deeds that he says? Well, you can learn about that all through Scripture, but... They're the very plans that God is revealing to us to be part of in our lives. His plans to change the community he has placed us in, to reach people who have lost hope in life, who are hurting, 
to give a hamper to someone in need at Christmas time. To fulfill the mission of God, we needed a base in this community. That's what God led us to do. This building was part of God's plan for this world. And so much good is going to pour out of this building for generations to come. Missionaries are going to be sent out from this place. I pray, I look forward to the day we're going to plant a church or two. There's going to be so much that's going to be come from here because God wants us to have a base for the mission He has for this community in the world. And it was a plan that's far beyond what we could ever have provided for. We knew that as we were moving towards trying to build this church. Yet in the history of this church is so much open-handed generosity. And it's been humbling as a pastor to witness this. People seeking first the kingdom of God by seeking His plans for how they would be part of this work and invest in the kingdom of God for the sake of so many who don't know about Jesus. Nothing's ever been forced. It's just been about God talking to each individual and people responding to His call and He just brings it all together in the way only God can to fulfill His plans. I think one of the greatest examples of that I shared at the grand opening was in 2019. We were so ready to break ground and start building this building. But we had this savings goal of $1 million to reach first. We still needed $346,000. And so we set that as our breaking ground target. And then at a special service, we took up an offering, just 45 envelopes from different people containing gifts and commitments were collected. And they were adding these up while I was preaching a sermon and they texted me the amount. And I was, had to look at it a few times hoping I wasn't reading one zero too many. $341,000. Just $5,000 short of this total. So much more than we had ever, ever raised in the history of this church. And then we held this breaking ground ceremony on this property. And on the Friday before it, we had received the whole amount to a million dollars plus five thousand dollars more. I, I reckon that detail is God. <laughs> you're five thousand short now, you're five thousand over on the breaking ground ceremony day. And this was an overwhelming seal from God that this was his plan being fulfilled. This was a year to begin the construction on this building. You can't make this stuff up, you cannot write it. We are not small, smart about it. But what I was thinking is that was 45 people, each responding to God in the way He led them. And it added all up to that amount. You're part of that 45. In fact, if you're part of ever responding to God's call to do this, you got it right, didn't you? You got it right. Whether it was a little amount or a large amount, it was exactly what God had called you to do. And that's what it's about, to listen to God and His plans. You made a plan to be generous and God blessed you. See, whenever we seek the Lord's plans and He leads us to an act of generosity, to care for someone in need, support His work, you can be sure that it's part of so much more than you can see in that moment. And he's writing and orchestrating so many things together to release good actions of love in this world. And, and you're part of that. What attraction really is there in closed fist living that gets put across our screens and sold to us every day? What attraction is there in that? Restful and disconnected so often from making a difference in this world for a brief moment in time. Far out, it's the big charade. The kingdom of God is eternal. This world is so broken and hurting, we got a chance to be part of that. 
Instead, God's teaching us that open-handed living that seeks first the kingdom of God really is better way by far. It's where joy, freedom, and love all come together, making an eternal difference and an individual difference in lives. And nothing can ever take that away. It never corrodes. It's on display in eternity forever and ever. Now, I reckon that's good news, don't you? What a wonderful calling. Why don't we pray together this morning? Lord, we just want to thank you again for this letter of James, Lord. It uh, could be an easy letter to just kind of skip over in our reading in the Bible. There's so many challenging things in there, Lord, though. But we're so thankful for it, Lord, because it speaks your truth right into the context of our very lives here today, Lord. We do want to thank you, Lord, that for who you are, Father. You're such a generous God, such a generous dad in heaven that has lavished so much goodness on us. You gave us your only son who gave his life freely on the cross for us so that we could have life, an act of pure grace, that we have been able to receive. None of our work, none of our good deeds make us deserve this, Lord. So we're thankful for the grace of God. But, oh, Lord, having received it, Lord, may we be people that now live it and share it. The gospel continues as we live with open-handed lives. And, Lord, even just this morning, as our response, each of us, Maybe for some here today, this is just a significant moment. Maybe you just want to do that as we're praying even this morning. Just, Lord, I'm just opening my hands physically before you. Just as a way of saying, Lord, I want to live an open-handed life. I want to be generous as you lead me to be, Lord. And so, Lord, we just take this opportunity to say sorry, Jesus, when when we've become all about our own indulgence, Lord, and what we want. and We're sorry, Lord, when we've overlooked those who, who need our help, Lord. We come and we repent this morning, Lord. And we just, just want to say to you, Lord, everything that we are and everything that we have is yours, Lord. God, today we're just we're releasing it, Lord. And we're trusting you, God, to provide for us. We're trusting you to lead us. And we pray, Jesus, that our lives would all be moving towards that great day when we're going to see you and enter into glory with you, Father. And I pray we'd be able to take so many with us, Jesus, that we would see a mighty revival even in our community as we have lives that are just ready to be channels of blessing. May this church be the biggest channel of blessing into the suburbs around us, Lord. Just your love and your life just pouring out of this place. Lord, that's so people just want to come here. They just want to find out what is happening because of the, the generosity, the love of the people that, that are here. Oh God, keep loosening our grip. Keep helping us to live in the freedom of these truths, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.